So at some point in the last couple of weeks, it might be within the last week, I mean, I don't know what day it is anymore, I did a video about the time when Ferrari's Ross Braun switched up Schumacher's strategy during the 1998 Hungarian Grand Prix, and in doing so, leapfrogged the two McLarens and won the race. Keeping his title hopes alive when he needed it, and thanks to some misfortune with Hakkinen's car, he was able to reduce the gap down by a huge chunk. But in 2004, the brains on the Ferrari strategy war went one stage further to get the Ferrari into the lead and win the race. Not by having Michael take on a three-stop strategy, because that's for amateurs. They were going to try a four-stop strategy. It's safe to say that the F2004 is one of the finest racing cars ever built. It dominated the 2004 season, and would have won the first 13 races of the season if not for a little mishap involving Schumacher and Montoya in the tunnel at Monaco, the incident gifting a first and only win for Jarno Trulli. The evolution of the F2003 GA would end up winning 15 of the 18 races, a strike rate only bettered by Mercedes in 2016 and McLaren in 1988, and probably Red Bull this year. The red car driven by the Michael and Rubens that year is the early 2000s F1 car. For Ferrari fans, it's what they want every year to be like. If you're not a Ferrari fan, it was a fucking menace. And if you're Montoya, Alonso or Raikkonen, then it was... Oh, what's the point in turning up? But while the car in race trim was absolutely blistering, qualifying was a less one-sided affair for Schumacher. Out of the 18 races that year, he was on pole eight times. Still the most of any driver that season, but the front row would also be occupied by his brother Ralph, Button, Barrichello, who had the next most amount of poles, Kimi, Fernando and Trulli. Ralph, Jensen, Kimi, Fernando and Jano having Michelin tyres on their cars, while the Ferraris had Bridgestones. There probably is a video on the tyre war in there somewhere, but I did do a thing on the whole 2003 tyre thing as a standalone video before, as well as doing one on the 2005 US Grand Prix. That one's probably due an update as it's one of the deleted ones. But because you've got two tyre manufacturers, the tyres will behave differently depending on things like the nature of the circuit and the temperatures. In 2003, the Michelin teams were closer to the Ferraris thanks to a heatwave in Europe, and the Michelins worked better in hotter weather. They were also better qualifying tyres, but tended to grain easier than the Japanese rubber on the Ferraris. Bridgestone also worked closely with Ferrari thanks to Ferrari being able to do unlimited testing at Fiorano, and both would get all the data they needed. I did do some extensive online searching to see if the tyres were indeed made specifically for Ferrari and Michael to maximise the chances of winning, but the only two websites I found were Reddit and a link to a website from Reddit. Although an article from 2003 says that Ferrari had gone with Bridgestone to Hireth and Estoril to develop tyres for the US Grand Prix that year, so it is possible. It probably explains why everybody except Sauber, Jordan and Minardi had swapped to Michelins by this point. But anyway, the French Grand Prix of 2004 at the Manicourt circuit. Once home of the Ligier team, it tended to produce races that, well other than 1999, I can't name one that was one to write home about. And the 1999 race was only memorable because it rained. I suppose there was 1996 when Schumacher's car blew up on the formation lap. I mean, that didn't make the race good, it's just a moment that sticks out, and it wasn't even in the race. Yeah, I'm struggling here. Now for 2004, the qualifying rules were different to how they are now. This is when F1 was experimenting with the made-for-TV types of sessions, where the cars would take to the track in a session on the Saturday morning in the order of the previous race. In the afternoon, that was reversed, so the slowest driver on that Saturday morning would go first and the fastest driver would go last. And because there was only ever one car on track, it meant that every team and their sponsors were guaranteed TV time. It would also be the Saturday afternoon time that determined your grid slot, Alonso went fastest to put his Renault on pole on home turf for Renault. Schumacher was just over a quarter of a second behind with Coulthard's McLaren third. Button was fourth of BAR and the rest of the top ten was made up of Trulli, Montoya, Sato, Genet, who was replacing Ralph who'd broken his back at Indy, Raikkonen and Barrichello. Panis, the only French driver on the grid, was in 14th for Toyota. Schumacher had actually pulled something out of the hat to be second in the first place, given that he was only just ahead of Coulthard and Button, and Trulli would have had second if he hadn't bottled his lap. So on to the race. Manicor is a lot like Hungary, difficult to overtake at. I mean, let's be honest, Manicor is just a test track that occasionally held a Grand Prix, much like Barcelona, except Manicor was much worse. Snooker table smooth tarmac, flat, and only one real overtaking zone with dirty air being a pain in the ass for the rest of it. That smooth tarmac was going to suit the Renaults and their Michelins down to the ground. The Michelins turned on immediately for grip while the Bridgestones took a bit longer to come into the operating window, which is why the likes of Schumacher and so on were hampered a little bit in this one-shot qualifying system. 
And with the Michelin's able to turn on like a light at a track that was near impossible to get past on, if Alonso led me on the hairpin, then he should be able to head off into the distance as Schumacher waited for his tyres to come up to temperature. Ferrari was also going to be hampered by the fact that the layout and the surface meant that the tyres suffered massive thermal degradation. More than Silverstone, more than Hungary, more than anywhere else they went to. The problem was so great as the F1 website explains is that a heavy fueled fresh tyred Bridgestone was as fast as a low fueled worn tyred Michelin. So the likes of Montoya, Coulthard, Button and Raikkonen could just undercut their way through to the front. Schumacher on a normal day wouldn't be able to do that. So Ferrari had the annoying situation of that they would be fast towards the end of a stint but not as fast as the Michelins would be at the start. Schumacher would be able to close the gap on Alonso in the latter stages, but not enough to get by, with everything being reset once they pitted. So the night before the Grand Prix, or on the morning of the Grand Prix, Schumacher, Braun and Todd sat down to figure everything out. That was when Luca Baldessari, the chief strategist at the time, came up with the idea. Four stops. Now a four stopper is unheard of today, it only happens if the weather is many changeable, or there's a boatload of safety cars and red flags. In these days, three stoppers were doable if you knew what you were doing, particularly at Hungary and at Manicor, but they were still rare. Usually a four stopper ended in humiliation and wasted time, but Schumacher heard the idea and thought it would be worth a crack. Ferrari was on the back foot versus the Michelins. They had to not just think outside the box to maximise the points, but the box was... Well, it was over there. Alonso's Renault bolted off the line, as did Trulli's for that matter since the Renaults were brilliant at starts, and it was Alonso, Schumacher and Trulli into Turn 1, followed by Button and DC. Alonso and Michael had lighter fuel loads versus the others, so they were able to pull out a gap. Such as the era of refueling, you could fuel heavy to go longer and take harder compound tyres that last longer, which work at hard to overtake tracks like Hungary, or you go lighter so you're faster but have to stop earlier. If you never got to see any of that, it does sound interesting but it just meant that all the race was done in the pit lane, because if you're on a heavier load than the guy ahead, why push to catch up when you can just wait for him to pit? Trulli behind was struggling to keep up with the German and the Spaniard ahead, which put a smile on the faces of Ferrari as it meant they were covered behind, and the more Trulli held up Coulthard and Button, the better, but then the crossover started to begin. Alonso's tyres were starting to fall off more than Michael's were and the gap started to close, but since Manny Corr was so difficult to overtake at, Michael couldn't do anything, so on lap 11, Ferrari decided to initiate ill plan. They brought Michael in on lap 11. Lap 11 of a race that was going to be 70 laps long. The stop was short, so this plus the mega short pit lane of Manicor meant that Schumacher lost very little time compared to doing this at most other circuits. Only one I can think of where something similar happens is Montreal. Renault assumed that Ferrari was doing something to avoid getting trapped in traffic. Alonso was in on lap 14 and rejoined in the lead, able to pull out a tiny bit on Schumacher as the Michelins were faster and working right out the box, while Michaels were only just getting out of bed. Ten laps later, he was back on the gearbox of the Renault and just like before, unable to pass. He'd probably been on the back of the Renault sooner had he not had to overtake other cars on the way through. With Schumacher back on Alonso, Braun decided to take the punt on Baldessari's idea as the pace of the Ferrari was evident. If it didn't work, they'd finish second at minimum as the gap behind was so big still six points in the championship that they were walking by this point. Schumacher's second stop came on lap 29 where they put in fuel for just nine laps. Nine. On the way out and in clean air, Michael was able to make use of his sheer consistency and the pace unlocked by a light car on fresh tyres to bang in qualifying lap after qualifying lap. Renault was watching this and thinking Ferrari had done all this to try and undercut Alonso and then go heavy after the final stop, which they assumed would be his third. Nope. Alonso had come in on lap 32, filling for 14 laps to take him to lap 46, and had been 5 laps ahead of schedule. So when Alonso rejoined he was now behind Michael, but Renault still assumed Ferrari had one more stop to make and then take on that heavy fuel load, where Alonso would be on a lighter one and be able to win. So imagine Renault's surprise when Schumacher was in again for his third stop on lap 42 and was in and out in a blink. Alonso had been given the lead again but it would be brief since he would be in on lap 46. When Michael came in, he was 5.5 seconds ahead, and would need about 28 laps of fuel. When Michael came in, he was about 5.5 seconds ahead, and would need 28 laps of fuel. But since Ferrari short fueled him, he rejoined 20 seconds behind Fernando, and this wasn't part of Renault's script. But even with that early tyre advantage, Alonso wasn't able to keep up with the lighter Ferrari, and Michael had to do this 1998 strategy of qualifying stints again to build the gap up to 25 seconds, and do this within 12 laps. 
By virtue of clean air, it was doable, and Michael entered the pits for the fourth time with enough of a gap ahead to get the fourth stop done and get out again. He'd have the same amount of fuel in as Alonso, but a much fresher set of tyres. Renault was done up like a kipper. Like McLaren in 1998, Ferrari had yanked their trousers down in front of the whole class, with Ferrari taking advantage of a short pit lane, better late on tyre wear, and a light car to get Michael into the lead with something that was an out-of-the-box roll of the dice. And it's the only time a fourth stop has been pulled off for the win, willingly. The day got better for Ferrari when Trulli screwed up the final corner and Barrichello sailed through to take third. Trulli would be fourth with Button, Coulthard, Raikkonen, Montoya, Weber and Genet making up the rest of the top ten. I'd say something here like the next Bridgestone runner was, but since it was a Sauber and Bridgestone's only top runner was Ferrari, it's not really worth mentioning. That's not to discredit what Ferrari did, it's that Michelin had Williams, McLaren and Renault, while Bridgestone worked closest with Ferrari, with the other Bridgestone runners being mid to back of pack. But it was a brilliant out of the box move on a track that should have played nicely into the hands of Alonso and Renault. Renault were tricked, and Ferrari laughed all the way back to Maranello before the British Grand Prix rolled around, which was won by Schumacher. Such was the dominance of Schumacher and Ferrari that year, the next time Ferrari would be beaten would be Spa, when Raikkonen won. The first time Ferrari was beaten on merit that year. So then, a look at the other time Ferrari didn't shit the bed with strategy. If you're a new F1 fan that has been shocked by this revelation that Ferrari was once able to do things without cocking it up, do like the video so I know I've done an educate, and for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks to the folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help support me on a more personal level, you can help out by hitting the link in the description, where you'll also find links to Discord, socials, F1 store affiliate, and other bits and pieces. Well, the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.